All right, everybody, last but not least, here's video for today. It's funny, I, I have a really good memory. I remembered that I won two games yesterday, except I didn't remember. I thought that on the two weeks that I played in the U.S. Chess, or the U.S. Chess League, the Pro Chess League, that I won one game each week, but actually I had two losses and two wins yesterday. So no draws, yay. Okay, the fourth game was against a grandmaster I'd never heard of. Um... He's pretty high rated for me not to have heard of him. His name is Yannick Gazzoli, G-A-Z-Z-O-L-I. The French Grandmaster. He's number 10 or 11 in France. And he's their board three. And he did pretty well. He uh, he won the two games that he didn't play Wesley So. Wesley So beat everybody. So Gazzoli had two out of three. And going into the last round, we were ahead by one point. We were ahead, I believe... Uh, six and a half to five and a half. Does that equal 12? Yeah. So every game was important. So is playing MVL and our board two. This, this is actually the pro chess league decided in the last game of the match, the boards would play each other. Board one would play board one and so forth. So that means anything could happen. Either side could win four zero or it could be two two. So I knew that my game would, would be pretty important because I'm, you know, I'm not playing one of the top players in the world. So I have a chance. Okay, so Gazzoli has the white pieces. He plays d4. I didn't know what he... I prepared for him, but I forgot, and nobody played against him when I play. So I play a lot of different stuff with black, but since I was successful in my first... in my debut in the Pro Chess League against Conrad Holt by playing the check or closed Benoni, I figure, okay, I'll do it again. I won with it last time. And I'm probably the only Grandmaster who plays this a lot. Um, I play this... Probably about a third of the time against D4, I also play the Chagorin, and I'll play the Estonian or Baltic defense, uh, and I'll do some other crazy stuff too. I play Kings Indian sometimes. Okay, and um, this is a common position here. Now, the reason I played this opening is in 1989 or so, when I was in Brussels, uh, Anand came to visit, and Vichy was playing in a, a Game 30 tournament, which I also played. In fact, I played Anand in the Game 30, which is funny. And um, he was playing this every game, and I'd never seen it before. Usually when they're playing all this block stuff, black likes to play g6, bishop g7. Okay, but Yasser plays this too with black. Now, when Yasser plays black, he likes to play for short castle right away, and then he plays knight e8, and then g6, knight g7, and then f5, hopefully. Um, I play a different way just because I, I saw the way Anand played, and I hadn't seen it before. And I like to do stuff that I have a lot of experience in that my uh, opponents have never faced before. What Nan did is he moved his knight around here. And again, if you do any kind of database search or chessgames.com or anything, something that has a lot of my games in it, you'll find that I'm black in this position quite often, and even in my previous videos. Okay, my opponents put their pieces everywhere. This guy decided bishop d3, knight g e2, so that's fine. Now, there's a famous... Famous? There's a famous uh, master uh, in New York. He's a legend in his own mind named Asa Hoffman. Asa Hoffman is a lifelong 2250 to 2450 player, um, FIDE and USCF, first one, then the other. And he likes to play these close kind of positions also. And he once told me whenever his opponent plays 92 in any position, he likes to play H5. And the idea is you want to play H4 and sort of kill the knight and you want to gain space on the king side. And if the knight went to f3, then h5 looks a little silly because you're weakening all these dark squares. So, you know, I used to just play knight f8, knight g6 here, but, you know, what the heck, h5. And there was an Aronian game, because Aronian likes to play this in Blitz and Rapid with black, where he was allowed to play h4, and he won a nice game because the white knight on e2 really didn't do anything. My opponent played h4, which I assume has to be correct. And I went black back to my usual plan of knight f8 to g6. And bishop d7, completing development. And here, you know, if white's not going to play g4, f4, which seems really unlikely, uh, he's got to play for b4, otherwise nobody's ever going to do anything. So he played a3. Makes sense. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my king, but since I played h5, I thought it might be a good idea to have my rook defend my h-pawn. And if the king side ever gets opened up, probably my rook's good on h8, not so good on f8. So I just play king f8. And the point is, if I want to, my knight on f6 can maneuver to e8 and then maybe c7. Or if the c pawn 
gets traded and I take back with D pawn and D6 is available, I can play knight e8 to d6. I actually ended up doing that. And I'm sort of making a waiting move. I want white white to do something. So bishop e3, king g8, and white played b4. This is very funny. If you watch a lot of my videos, uh, or you're my private student, um, a lot of times I say never move pawns because you make too many weaknesses. Well, white's moved all of his pawns. So this was the problem that Conrad Holt had against me a few weeks ago. And you can find that game if you do a search of the Pro Chess League games. Um, I think it was week one. But uh, he pushed all his pawns also, and eventually there were too many weaknesses. And after b6, and he traded, I actually had to think here. White doesn't have to trade on c5, but it gives me a decision. Uh, the computer does not like my move, but I really like playing knight e8 to d6 if I have a chance. I took big with a d pawn. Um, and, of course, I, I will now have a chance. Okay. Now, a lot of people won't play these positions with black because white has more space. White has a passed pawn. You know, black doesn't really have any counterplay to speak of. But usually in blitz and rapid, I find my opponents get too frisky and they try to play too aggressively with white instead of slowly building. Who wants to slowly build in blitz chess? And usually black gets a lot of counterplay then. Okay, white made a move which you may find weird, but I have played these openings so often I don't find anything weird. He played king to d2. And the king's really safe in the center because the center is just totally blocked. And now if white wants to play on the queen side with something like a4, a5, or white wants to play on the king's side by pushing his king's side pawns, this king's okay on d2. Okay, I played my knight e8 to d6 maneuver. He played a4, makes sense, knight d6. And he played knight b5, and I had a real think here. I wasn't sure what to do. I thought about playing bishop takes b5, but after a takes b5, he could double or triple on the a file, and I didn't really see any counterplay for me. So I didn't want to weaken my b6 square by playing a6, but I decided to do it anyway. Um, this way, if I want to play b5, I'm, I'm ready to do it. So again, it's very blocked. It's very hard for either side to try to break through, but okay, it's a game 15. We both have about eight minutes left here, so something funny is going to happen eventually. Queen to b3, putting pressure on b6, rook b8. Knight c3, making b5 virtually impossible, virtually. And now I decided that my rook was on h8 too long, and that since the last few moves were on the queen side, I wasn't really worried about him playing g4 and f4. So I played king h7. He went back to d1, supposedly, I guess, to put pressure on h5. I wasn't really concerned. I played rook f8. Maybe I'll play f5 later. I can tuck my king away. And if he ever plays the move f4 with a discovered attack on my pawn, I can always play bishop g4. Although, let's face it, if he plays f4 and pawns get traded in the center, his king on d2 could eventually get you know open. Okay, he played queen e2, and I played king g8. So if you just started watching the video or you just started watching my game on the internet when it was being played, it would probably be very hard for you to believe that black didn't castle this game because it really looks like black castle. Okay, and he played rook h to b1, so I wasn't worried about the king side at all now. I was worried about him doubling on the b file and playing a5 and attacking me over there. Okay, now I played a move that's typical for me in this opening. It's funny how I learned all of my stuff from Anand. I guess that's why I'm winning occasionally. Anand is a pretty good player, five-time world champion and all. Uh, when I played Anand in 1986, my first time abroad in Oakham, England, in the youth tournament they have there, um, I was about 22, 50 maybe, and he was 2,400. And we're almost exactly the same age. I'm, I'm three months older than him. We were both 16. And um, in that game, I was white in sort of a blocked position like this. It was actually a QGA. And out of the blue, Anand was playing really fast in those days. He played the move knight h8 seemingly for no reason. And it turned out he was just remaneuvering his knight to better squares. And knight h8 was actually a good move. And if you saw my game with Conrad Holt from a few weeks ago in the Pro Chess League, I also played knight h8. Usually I do that in response to h5. And then my knight goes to f7 eventually. Now you might remember earlier in the game, my knight was on d6 and it got traded. Well, d6 is a good square. It blocks the center past pawn. And I could play knight e7, knight c8, then knight to d6, but I decided to play knight h8. And this way, if my h pawn gets attacked with either g4 or f4, I could play g6 if I want to. Okay, so knight h8, uh, very talented junior player, Akshat Chandra, 
2,500 feet, 2,600 USCF. After the game, he told me he was really impressed with that move. Okay, so all my good ideas I steal. I've played knight h8 in this opening many times. Usually my opponent plays h5 first. Okay, so rook b2. I thought he was going to double on the b file. f6 to play knight f7. He did double. And now I was worried about a5, so I played queen c7. That way I defend my pawn a little more on c5, and I defend my rook a little more on b8. And also, if he wants to play f4, I defend that a little more. So I finally moved my queen. And now he surprised me. After playing rook a, b1, he played rook g1. Now he wants to attack on the king side. He can't make up his mind. Okay, knight f7 and g4. And I don't want him to play g5 or gh5, so I took. My bishop is defending the pawn. He can't take with the rook, so he took back. And now I don't want to get smushed. He can play g5 and start attacking me on the king side. Since he's moved all of his pawns and his king is on d2, I played b5, sacrificing a pawn but trying to get at his king. Takes, takes, takes. And now I quote unquote sacrifice another pawn with c4. He can't take on c4 because if you, I could play rook fc8, for example, or rook bc8. And this is, uh, is going to be good for black. That's not something you want to have with white there. You're just going to lose material. So he played bishop c2, which I expected. And I played bishop c5. And finally, I'm going to play knight d6. Um, and then I have good chances to win back the pawn on b5. The e4 pawn is weak. His king is a little exposed. And now he made... Um, an error giving me the advantage. Probably the computer evaluates this as equal, but it's not the kind of equal that's going to end in a draw. White's up a pawn. Both kings are getting attacked. A lot of the minor pieces are misplaced or in funny places. And here he tried to trade pieces because he's up a pawn and he has two passed pawns. King's on d2. That makes a lot of sense. So he traded bishops and played queen e3. And this happens a lot in chess, the psychological part that's not talked about a lot. I made a move that he overlooked in this position, and my move was good. And after that, he sort of fell apart. And um, this actually idea that he played with takes and queen e3 is actually bad. And in fact, black only has one way to refute it. So white has an advantage here if black doesn't play the right move. But if black does play the right move, the computer gives him an evaluation of about plus one for black. So pause your video and try to find the winning move for black. What did I play in this position? Okay, and I saw the winning move right away. I didn't know it was winning. In fact, I didn't know if I was better here. I thought it might be worse, not a pawn. But I was a little worried to play it, but then I decided it was the best. And John Nunn calls this, uh, let's see, what does John Nunn call this? I've only said it a thousand times. Uh, Collinear move. It's when you have two pieces that are moving towards each other and they stop. So, of course, my queen could take his queen, and they both move in that direction. They're both queens, but I play queen d4 check. And I was very confused here. I thought he would play king e2 in one second because I didn't think there was another move. And after king e2, my original idea was to play knight d6 because I wanted to play knight d6 for like the last you know six moves. But I realized while he was thinking that knight h6 is a good move, and in fact... After the game, when I was confused why he played what he did, and I said, why didn't you play king e2? He said, oh, I think knight h6 wins. And I was like, it wins? Wow. And I looked, I looked, I looked. I used an engine, and I think he's right. Uh, king e2 is still the best move. What he did was worse. But after knight h6, he's in trouble. Um, for example, if you play sort of the obvious move, bishop g4 is really hard to meet. Is king is having some trouble staying on his queen there. And I could take on g5 first, but bishop g4 check is probably better. Uh, well, knight g4 is not bad either. Knight g4 also wins, I think. So knight h6 is really strong because the g-pawn is just indefensible, and I'm breaking through on the king side. So he didn't like knight h6, so after a long thing, he took on d4, which obviously loses a piece. I'm threatening a piece, and if it moves, I play c3 check. And also, even if I didn't win a piece, those are pretty nice pawns. And now my knight has another good square. So now black's winning. He played knight e2. I could play d3 or c3. c3 turns out to be better. Um, I, want, I want him to actually keep his bishop. His bishop is blocked by all of his pawns. And if he kept his knight, his knight has lots and lots of good squares. So I want to win his knight, which I did. 
And for those of you who think three pawns is worth a piece, think again. If you're my private student, you know that a piece is worth nine pawns. Okay, anyway, I played rook c8 check, getting my rook active. And I played knight e5, threatening knight f3 check, and knight c4 check, forking all of his kings and all of his rooks. Okay, so he had to stop everything, played rook b3. And I checked, and I took my pawn back. Okay, and we traded, and now he's down a piece for two pawns, and I'm threatening knight a3 and knight e3, and this is tremendous here, and he can't break the pin by moving his king because he just walks into the forks there. Okay, use the forks. Okay, so he played a good move, rook g3, stopping all of my knight moves, and I always tell my students, activate your king in the end game, and I really don't like my king here opposite his rook, so I play king f7, and the rest was basically technique. I'm up a piece. As long as I can hang on to one of my pawns, I should be fine. Uh, he made a mistake here with rook f3. He should take on f6 and then play rook h3. And the, I, I, I don't know if he wanted to play e5 here. I'm not sure if that was his plan when he played rook f3. We didn't really talk about it. But he plays e5 here. I play knight c4 check. So that doesn't, that doesn't work at all. And then I take with the knight. So Okay, so he traded on f6. And after king e3, I broke the pin, king e7. My f pawn's not pinned anymore. And I'm just up a piece here. This isn't really too difficult. As long as I can keep my pawn, I should be doing fine. And at the very end, he played check. King takes pawn should be a winning rook and pawn ending, but might as well keep my knight. And here he resigned, confusing some of the onlookers. They thought he could play the move d7. He could play the move d7. In fact, he probably should have played the move d7 in case I make a mistake here. Although, it's possible king takes pawn wins, but I don't think it does. I think that's a draw. King takes, rook takes, rook f1, king c5. It's got to be a draw. Okay, um, but anyway, I have a very easy winning move here. Pause your video if you want to find it. Black to play, what's the easiest winning move? And the answer, of course, is rook to d1, and I just scrape up the pawn. Uh, if he plays king c7, I take with check. And if he plays king c6, I can, of course, blunder a piece if I want and still win. This is an easy win because I just queen my pawn. Uh, if I don't want to blunder a piece and make a queen, I could just win the pawn for free with check and, and then take the pawn. So after rook d1, it's really lost. He knew I would find rook d1. So in this position, he resigned. So I was able to beat a higher rated player. I haven't done that in a long time. And with the black pieces... We were very fortunate that Wesley played well yesterday. He went 4-0. He beat MVL in the last round. Our bottom board was able to beat theirs. So we ended up winning the match 9.5, 6.5, even though our opponents were higher rated than we were. The Marseille migraines were a pretty tough team. And um, it was a very close match throughout, and we were very lucky to win. Well, I hope you like my four videos today. You can donate four times as much. That'll put me in my place. The website is www.8clchessclub.com. It's the website of our new chess center, which we're opening in September. And I'm going to keep making videos. I'm probably not going to make four per day. Although, if I do play next week in the Pro Chess League on Wednesday, I'm not sure if I'm playing yet, uh, then maybe maybe I will make some more videos uh, for a day. Although, I am playing in a Norm tournament next week, so I don't know, I'm sort of busy. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Like, subscribe, follow me on Facebook. Follow the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta on Facebook and on uh, Twitter. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.